Wow, what an honor to be here this morning. You guys doing okay? Everyone feeling all right? Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. You're in church, you made it. Please take your seats. Uh, man, what an honor it is to be here uh, this morning with you. And can we just give it up for your pastors again, Pastor Jim and Phyllis? Man, we love you guys. You're amazing. Uh, just, just really amazing friends. You know, it is, uh, I, I, we were talking about that yesterday. It's crazy. You know, I used to, when I was younger, I, 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 I'm so old now. Uh, but uh, when I was younger, I used to hear people say, man, we've been friends for, you know, you hear your parents say it, 10, 15, 20 years. And you're like, wow, these people are so old, you know. And now I'm one of those people. And so, uh, so it is just amazing to see what God does when um, you just, you, 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 you put your hand to the plow and you just keep pushing and fighting. And, and just it's amazing to see what, um, what you guys have done. And, and this movement here at Anchor Bend, uh, it is beautiful to watch. And um, it is truly a movement of God. This isn't normal. Uh, for, for God to, to, to do what he's done in only a couple of years here as a church, it's remarkable. It's unbelievable. I think about 2,000 people that have come in here and experienced the love of God and, and given their lives, surrendered their lives to Jesus. I mean, that is something to celebrate. Um, and, and I do, I want to confirm and, and, and just stand on that word for 2019 for you as a church. And um, you know what's interesting? The church just isn't about these four walls. We are the church. We are God's church. Uh, we gather on Sunday to scatter and be the church in our community. And so uh, it is just beautiful to see what's taking place. And I'm, we, we love you guys, and it is such a high honor for us to be here. And, and um, yeah, it, we, we're so excited about Peru this summer, and I want to invite you formally to pray about being a part of this movement. Uh, we believe that we've entered into the greatest ministry decade since the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the time. There is an acceleration taking place in our world that the world has never seen before. And what's so exciting, you might ask, Gabe, why is this decade so important? Why is this the most, um, th th this is the, the, the um, you know, why are we going to see amazing things take place in this decade? And it's for one reason. We believe that the world is yet to see the power of a church united. And God's church, Jesus' bride, is uniting like never before around the world to be a part of transforming cities and nations. And whether you know it or not, the vehicle that God has ordained to sustain transformation in cities is the church. It is the church. It's us. We are, it's, it's us. This is, the, we're, 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 the, we're, we're the only thing that the world has. And, and as the church of Jesus Christ, we should be leading everyone everywhere. And so I want to encourage you. You know, I'm really excited about this time. I'm excited that we're talking right before we're going into the new year. Because I believe that everything that we've walked through, the entirety of our lives thus far, has been for a reason. And, you know, just, it just in the mindsets of people, when, we, when we're transferring into a new year, it's a very exciting time because we get to leave things in the year that we're in right now and not take them with us into 2019. And so I want to um, speak to you a very specific message this morning that I believe God has given me um, for the church um, in this time and in this season. And I'm really believing that it's going to be a powerful word that transforms your life. Can we, can we just be in agreement there? Yes? Can we pray together? Father, we just thank you for this moment. God, we ask you to speak to us, to do something supernatural in this place, whether we're watching online or podcasts or we're here this morning. Um, God, I thank you, God, that you do something so supernatural in our hearts, in our lives. We submit and yield to you, and we say, do whatever you want to do this morning in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, I want to encourage you uh, to, to grab your Bibles, pull out, turn them on, flip them open, however you do uh, your Bible. Grab some notes, maybe take some notes. I want to uh, encourage you to be writing things down because I do believe I have a specific word for you this morning. Um, I, I also know that studies show that those of us who take notes have a higher likelihood of getting into heaven. And so I want to be there with you. Um, and so I just encourage you to really dig in and, and, and really engage uh, with me this morning because I do feel like it's, um, we're, we're going we're gonna to go on a journey together, amen? In Romans chapter 8, 
The Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, uh, makes a statement that is so powerful. And he makes this statement, and it directly ties in to God's people and the purpose uh, that, 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 that God's people, uh, and the thing that we're supposed to occupy with our lives. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For all creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. See, the Apostle Paul makes this statement, and it's full of, uh, uh, of meat, and I want to just break it down for just a moment. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. So he says that I want you guys to be clear about one thing. Everything you've gone through in your life, all of the struggles, all the challenges, all the hurt, all the loss, all the ups, all the downs, everywhere in between, everything that you've gone through in your life was for a reason. Because... There is a glory that will be revealed to you. Now, he doesn't say that there's just going to be a glory that's revealed to you when you go to heaven one day. He says we have glory that is revealed to us now. We have access. We sing the songs. We, we worship. We say the word glory. We talk about it all the time. And there is a glory as Christians, as sons and daughters of this great King Jesus that we serve. We have access to glory radiating through our lives. What is glory? Well, glory is very clear. Remember, there was this moment, if you rewind, go back to the Old Testament in Exodus, there's this moment where, where Moses asks God, he says, God, let me see your glory. And what does God say back to him? He says, I'll let you see my goodness. You see, there is a goodness that we have access to, that, that, that is a glory that we have access to. But the crazy thing, and I think far too often we don't even realize what we have access to as Christians, what we have access to as believers, what we have access to in the supernatural, what we have access to. And so, if you remember, um, he sees God, and God does this amazing thing, and, and they said that the Bible says they had to put a, 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 like a, a garment over Moses' face because when he saw the glory of God, he was radi radiating so much the glory that people couldn't look at his face, Okay? And now fast forward back to Paul. Paul says, I want you guys to know that what you suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that you have access to. And all creation is waiting for you. There's a reason you have access to glory. All creation is waiting for you. And then he says this. He goes, and what you need to realize is that our father Moses, who experienced that glory back then, what he had access to, doesn't even look like glory at all compared to what we have now because of Jesus' sacrifice for you and for me. We have access to a glory. We have access to a glory. It's beautiful. And what I've realized over the course of my life is that our faithfulness with what's in our hand always determines what's next in our life. You see, God has given us a seed. God has given you a seed of greatness, and he's placed it in your hand. And that is what I want to talk about with you this morning, because I believe as we're celebrating what God does, maybe you're not using the word celebrate, maybe you're just like, thank God 2018 is over and done with, wherever you are in that, if we would just adjust our perspective on how we look at the things that we've walked through, it will change the way that we walk into the future. And so God has placed a seed of greatness in your hand. And, and, and the natural thing, you know, we read these big words and we talk about Paul saying that we have access to glory and there's, the creation is waiting. And you think, well, yeah, creation's probably waiting for my pastor or, you know, the holy people or, you know, all, but, but what have I really got to offer creation? And I don't know about you, but when I read my Bible, my Bible says that God is no respecter of men. That means that every single one of us has a seed of greatness that God has given us. And, and when we realize that, everything shifts, everything changes. Your current reality is a reflection of what you believe, period. 
And so if you see yourself with a, with a seed of greatness, that means that, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow this thing to flourish and see what God does. And so there's a challenge that I wanted to kind of talk with us about, and it's an opportunity. And it's a great time to be talking about it. And in and, and, and Luke chapter 9, we see Jesus, and I want to I talk about a couple of these verses in Luke chapter 9 because we, we see this story, we see this, this preparation that Jesus is taking the disciples through in Luke chapter 9, and, and Jesus is preparing his 12 to go out on their journey of life, their journey, their Christian life, being Christ followers. He's empowering and equipping his disciples, but really Christians everywhere for all time on how we are to to live and operate in this kingdom that we live in as Christians, okay? You with me? So in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is gathering his disciples. He says, guys, come around. I want to tell you something. He says this in Luke chapter 9, verse 1. He says, one day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out, not some, not a couple, all demons and to heal all diseases. Now that's pretty cool. Like, Jesus calls together his disciples, and it's not just a, it, it, that's the, that, that is the supernatural thing that we have access to. You know, the Bible says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead actually lives inside of me. So it's not just, when, 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 if Jesus is indwelling in me, that means that I have a glory. That means when I walk into a room, everything changes, because I represent Jesus. I, I represent Jesus when I walk into a room, Okay. You're getting me off on a tangent here. So Jesus calls together the disciples. He says, he goes, guys, I want you to know that you have all power and all authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick. That, now, that's great. That's awesome. I want to be a part of that. I can imagine they were getting excited. And then he says this in verse 2. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said this. Hey, by the way, guys. I love the by the ways. I added that. Take nothing for your journey, he instructed them. Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, or money, or even a change of clothes. Now, hold on a second. Because so often, we read over scriptures, and we read, it's like, oh, yeah, that's great. I'm just doing my, my reading, you know, the day. This is great. But when you really think about these three verses, Jesus is instructing Christians for all time on what our journey of following after Jesus over the entirety of our life should look like. So Jesus is saying, guys, I want you to realize, I want you to realize, Anchor Ben, I want you to realize you have access to cast out all demons and to heal all sick. You have all authority. God is no respecter of person. That means you have access to it. Once you see yourself the way that God sees you, you will come alive to who you always were, not who you could become. You were always that person. It's just a matter of how you see yourself, okay? So, so Jesus says, guys, I want you to realize you have all authority. I want you to, this morning to realize you have all authority. But he says, I want you to also understand something that's very critical. I need you to know that the journey of life that we're going on, you can bring nothing with you. You can take no walking stick. Now, I never really understood this because... What's wrong with the walking stick? I just, I, you know, I upgraded my walking stick. Why can't I bring a walking stick, God? You know, like, I, I, I understand these. Okay, God, I understand what you're trying to say here. I understand Jesus. You're trying to teach us that we got to depend on you and all of these things. I was praying over this verse a couple months ago, and I said, God, I understand the food. I understand you want to be our provider, all that stuff. But what I don't understand is the walking stick. Can you tell me a little bit more on the walking stick? And I instantly, and this doesn't always happen to me, but I instantly felt the Holy Spirit responded to me quick. And, and it was this, because this journey of life that you're going on is going to be long. There are going to be times that it's hard. And I don't want you to ever be tempted to lean into anything else except for me. So Jesus is saying, listen, I, you take nothing for your journey. Don't take a walking stick, a bag, food. Underline that one, circle it. We're going to come back to it. Food, money, or a change of clothes. You know it's easy to follow Jesus when your clothes are clean. It's easy to follow Jesus when you have a fresh coat of deodorant on, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then things start to get stinky, and you're like, God, what is the deal? I had a brand new bag. I could have brought all my clothes. And then finally he says this, wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave the town. And if the town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust from your feet and move on. 
What is he saying by when he says that? He's saying, listen, where I'm sending you, not everyone will always accept you. Not everyone will accept your way of living. Not everyone will agree with you. Not everyone will validate you. And we live in a life, in, in a world where we're constantly taking in the opinions of others and ascribing them to who we are, which is toxic, dangerous, tragic, awful. Every single person, we do it. It's, it's a struggle. People say things. They don't believe in us. God, I'm, hey, 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 family. Hey, happy holidays, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. I feel like I'm supposed to do this this year. And what does everyone do? <laughs> they, no one validates what you're supposed to. I don't know why I made that noise. It just came out. It's not in my notes. <laughs> they don't validate it. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I want to take you on this journey, and it's called life, and I want you to realize that you need to depend on me. I am your provider. I am your source for everything. See, the constant, the, 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 the things that we struggle with when we read something like this, when we hear something like this, when we read this verse, the two things that I think are the, 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 the things that, that are the greatest struggles are, number one, first and foremost, trust. Am I willing to trust God that where I'm going on this journey of running after him, he will provide for me? We live in a world and that, that in a culture, I should say, that every single day that goes by, we are focusing on what we're accumulating and how we can insulate ourselves from disaster. Now, I'm not saying we, we're to be unwise and, you know, we're not to, you know, we're just to, you know, live foolishly and all of those things. But what I am saying is that if we're not careful, there's a mindset that takes place that puts us in a posture to protect what we have. And every single time you get into a posture to protect, you end up losing what you have. And so, 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 so first and foremost, it's trust. The second thing is, are we willing to surrender what we've built to God? Are we willing to surrender what took us, you know, and, and some of us are a little older, we understand what this looks like a little more because maybe you've been fighting to build something for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And when you, when you think about just switching the attitude of your heart and the direction of your life saying, God, everything I have is for you. That means you get everything. You get the glory. And so I'm just going to take my hands off everything and let you drive this car. That can be hard as we accumulate, as we build, as as we work for something for decades. If you don't believe me, just ask the rich young ruler. He was a guy who was young, he was rich, he was good looking, he had everything, he knew scripture. He walked up to Jesus and asked him, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, go sell everything. And the Bible says that he went away that day and he was sad. Why was he sad? He didn't actually lose anything. Of his materials, he was sad because he knew the truth. And see, so many of us, we know the truth, but we allow our, the, the, the journey that we're on of faith, of the accumulation of things, to, to distract us. And it's, it's just a fine line. You have, we have to be careful. God, what is the attitude of your heart? God, you have everything. And so Jesus is preparing the disciples. He's saying, guys, we're going to go on a journey. It's called life. I want you to, to follow after me, but you can take nothing with you on this journey. And then later, instantly, Jesus begins to put this to practice. And we see, in this same story, in this same chapter, we see that, that Jesus is then later ministering in a very famous um, story where Jesus is ministering and teaching and healing the sick. And, and it's, the, it's the famous story of, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. You see, 5,000, the Bible says that 5,000 men gathered after Jesus equipped the disciples. They start going on a journey. 5,000 men then gathered, plus their, their children, plus their families. It could have been upwards of 20,000 people that, have been, that were gathered to hear Jesus minister. And so Jesus is there. He's teaching. He's preaching. And the disciples are there with him. And Jesus had just equipped them and empowered them and gave them authority to, to cast out demons and heal the sick and said, bring nothing with you. And Jesus is in the middle of, of, of preaching and teaching and healing the sick. And he looks to his disciples and he asks them a question. Now, how many of you know whenever Jesus asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> just a word to the wise. Just keep your mouth shut at this point. <laughs> really think before you answer that question. So he asked them, he says, guys, these people are probably hungry. Did anybody bring any food? 
And I can only imagine, now, I wasn't there, but I got to just tell the story how I would see it, you know, because sometimes I think Jesus is funny. I think he has a sense of humor. So the, the, the disciples are standing there and they're like, uh, <laughs> did you hit your head? You just said, you just said, I left my walking stick, my new walking stick at home. I left my traveler's bag. I left my money. I left the food. What do you mean? <laughs> did we have any food? What do you mean how are we going to feed these people? You feed the people. You told us not to bring any food. So he tells the disciples to go out and start combing the crowd. And, you know, we've probably read this story before. And I, for, for me, it's, you know, I've, I've just wondered this my whole life. There's no biblical backing for this. But I've, I've wondered and I've, I, it's highly, it's not probable that only one person and the entire crowd of 20,000 people has something to, to offer up that day. You know, I have gum and maybe some cough drops in my pocket. I could have offered those as an after-lunch snack, you know. Uh, I'm sure we have something. You know, we, I have small children. We have Cliff Bars on tap, you know. It's like, Cliff, be quiet. Cliff Bar, you know. Uh, <laughs> pirate booty. Here you go, baby, you know. <laughs> I love that stuff. God bless that stuff. It's gluten-free. Um, and so, so he, uh, the Bible says that there's one young boy, though, that offers up some fish and some bread. Now I can imagine that this young boy, for us, has got to this place, he's hearing Jesus preach, he's hearing Jesus teach, he's hearing um, Jesus and watching Jesus, I should say, do miracles and heal the sick, and he's probably thinking to himself, there are a lot of people here today. I have no idea what these disciples are doing, they're asking for food to try to feed everybody. And if this guy is really who he says he is, what have I got to lose if I just offer up my lunch? I brought this lunch. I brought a couple pieces of bread. I brought some fish. This could either be the greatest day of my life or I'm going to go home hungry. Either way, I'm kind of good. And I believe that the mentality in of this little young boy who offers his food, his lunch that day, shows the nature and the type of person that Jesus is looking for on this earth to show himself to this earth. And Jesus was trying to teach the disciples that very thing that day, earlier that day. And so, so we, they comb the crowd, and Jesus begins to do this thing. And we see this mirac miracle that takes place, and they feed 20,000 people. And the Bible says that this boy's lunch fed 20,000 people, and it wasn't just enough. It was more than enough. We serve a God that is more than enough. He always provides, I don't know about you, but when I look back at my life, it's not void of hardship, it's not void of loss, but I think about, man, the hardest things that I've been through have been things that have qualified me to actually see miracles take place. And so if we would just realize that, man, maybe 2018 was a rough year, but if I change my perspective and elevate the way that I see my life and the significance of my life, everything shifts. That means if I'm going through hardship, that must mean that there's something even greater that God is asking me and, and, and making a way for me to walk into. Does that make sense? A couple of things that I want to share with you this morning before we close is, 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 is a truth. Three, really three things um, is this, and I, I encourage you to write these things down, to meditate over them, to pray over them. The first one is this, how you use what's in your hand determines your level of increase. How you use the seed that God has given you determines your level of increase, not what's in your hand. Not what's in your hand, but how you use what's in your hand. How you use it. Are you going to have a faith that says, God, I don't see how it's going to happen, but that doesn't matter. I have a faith that says, God, I believe that you are the God of the impossible. And whether it's possible or impossible, it's the same to you. You want to radiate your glory through my life. And so I submit to you. I yield to you. How you use what's in your hand determines your level of increase. You see, God has given us all something. He's given us our families. He's given us our relationships. He's given us jobs. He's given us, he's given us so much. 
and how we use it determines what's next. You see, what's in your hand right now isn't what's all, what will always be in your hand, but how you use it determines what increase you experience, the level of increase you experience. If you don't believe me, just ask the guy with one talent who buried it. The second thing is what's in your hand will always feel insignificant. It will always feel insignificant. It will always look maybe insignificant to you. I can imagine that young boy woke up that morning and he opened up the refrigerator. I know they didn't have refrigerators back then, but just be with me for a moment. I can imagine he woke up that day and he said, hey, I'm going to go hear Jesus preach and teach today. It's that guy, you know, I'm going to go hear him. I can't wait. Um, But who took the fresh fish? All we have is the weak old fish. And so I opens up the fridge. He grabs a couple pieces of bread and some fish because he knew he was probably going to get hungry. And he packed his lunch that day. I can imagine that what was in his hand probably looked, smelled, felt insignificant. That young boy woke up that day and just packed his lunch. He said, Go, this is what God has given me. That's great. And maybe, maybe he didn't even say that. <laughs> maybe he just said, I need to eat. <laughs> maybe he just said, I'm hungry. You know, I'm going to pack a lunch. That's great. You see, what we have in our life right now is there for a reason. And if we're not careful, if we don't have the proper perspective, it will always feel insignificant. But it's not necessarily our feeling that matters. It's our knowing that God, man, the same, the, same, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of me. That means every encounter I have, every person I talk to, everything in my life is there for a reason. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Moses is a prime example of this. God tells Moses, Moses, I want you to free my people. I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to go back to Pharaoh. And I want you to tell him, we all know the story, he, I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses goes, goes and, 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 and goes to meet God, and he's having this conversation with God. And, and um, he says, God, I don't, you got the wrong guy. It's a beautiful dialogue. It's, it's amazing to watch. And so, you know, it's easy to just say, oh, Moses, you're, you, you know, you're not very smart. But we do the same thing all the time. You know, we, we feel like God is asking us to do something, and we, we instantly come to him with what we, why we can't do it. Or, God, I'll do this if. I'll do this when. And so God is telling Moses over and over again. He's like, God, I, he's telling God. It's, it's hilarious to read. God, I stutter. I can't talk. I, 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 I can't be your mouthpiece. What if they don't believe me? He goes through this with God. And God says, Moses, it's beautiful. Check this out. Don't miss this. Moses. What's in your hand? I can, it's, it was probably just like, what do you mean what's in my hand? I have a, he, and a, he was holding a shepherd's staff in his hand when God said that to him. He said, Moses, throw that on the ground. Throws it on the ground. Throws that staff on the ground. That seemingly insignificant shepherd's staff, just a piece of wood. Throws it on the ground. It becomes a snake. He says, now grab the tail of the snake and it becomes a shepherd's staff again. What is God saying? I don't care as much about what's in your hand. Are you willing to trust me and offer what I've given you so that you can see increase? What's in your hand will always feel insignificant. It will always feel insignificant. But the reality is, is that every single person in this room, you have a seed of greatness that God has given you And you have a seed that the world actually needs. You know, God wanted, when God wanted to express a dimension of himself, you were born. You were born. And the third thing this morning is that by keeping our hands open before God, your seed will transform your life. But we have to keep our hands open. You see, what you hold on to in this life is really all you'll ever have. But what you give, God always multiplies. Now, I'm not, just, I'm not talking about money. I don't want to cheapen this message. I'm just talking about, I'm just talking about what's the attitude of your heart with everything. What is, are, you, are your hands open? Are you offering? Are you allowing him? Are you allowing this freedom of, of exchange between you and God to where he can use you, direct you however he sees fit? You see, I believe we need to go home and take a deep breath this morning and say, God, I've been living my whole life this way, and 
I repent for seeing what I have as insignificant. I'm so sorry. You've created me. You've given me the air that I breathe. I'm not by accident. The Bible says that I was fearfully and wonderfully made. You made me fearfully, wonderfully. There is, he is no respecter of persons. That means he's given you something for a reason. And our hands open before him. You see, the interesting thing as we stand to our feet this morning is that we need to realize that the lives that we're supposed to live and lead need to be in a position of advancing the kingdom of God. And the only way that we advance is by surrendering our lives to him wholeheartedly, giving him everything, everything. Saying, God, everything I have is you. It's not about what's in my hand, it's about what I do with what's in my hand that determines my level of increase. And I refuse to look at what I have right now as insignificant ever again. It's for a reason. And as a result, my hands are open. My hands are open before you have everything, you have my whole life. I am the salt of the earth. I am a light to the world, a city on a hill. He has put you in a position, an elevated position to shine to your world, to shine in your family, to shine in your workplace. Gabe, my workplace doesn't look like church. Well, that's your fault. Sorry, that was a little strong. That was for me. I was looking in the mirror at that one, actually. <laughs> I love you guys. Someone told me to say it. I have an earpiece in. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. But where to be the light? Where to be salt? That's what we are to be. Jesus, we welcome you in this place. We thank you, God, for speaking to us. What's in our hands determines our level of increase. God, I thank you that every single person would see what they have as significant in Jesus' name. We would never take for granted what you've given us ever again in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. For those of us this morning who are saying, man, I, I, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Everything you've talked about, Gabe, has been, has, 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 there's something taking place in my heart. I can't even shake it. I don't, I don't know what this feeling is. Maybe you were close to God at, at, at some point in your life and you've fallen away. Or maybe you're here for the very first time and someone brought you. If everything today was for you, it was worth it. And I want to say a prayer for those of you who say, man, I want to start 2019 and do something different. I want to leave things in 2018. I want to, I want to get on a journey of life with Jesus. And you, let me tell you something. You need to be plugged into this house. You need to be plugged into the church. That is the only way that you're going to survive. That's the only way. And so I want to say a prayer with you really quickly. And if, if maybe you're praying this prayer for the very first time, we're all going to repeat this prayer. But I want you to say this prayer with an honest confession, confession in your heart, you and God. But I, we're going to repeat it together. But if you're praying this prayer for the very first time, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell somebody today. You need to tell somebody about this decision. You need to tell somebody that, man, I gave my life to Jesus today. There's no going back. Can we pray together? Let's pray together. Everyone repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I'm ready. I surrender. I believe that you live, that you died, and that you rose again. Say, Jesus, today I surrender my life to you. Forgive me. I want to pursue all that you have for me from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's the best decision you can ever make with your life. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. We love you.